I told you that one in four people will develop a mental disorder, would you believe me? Would you believe that if this entire auditorium in the high school is here, that one whole grade would suffer from a mental illness at some point in their lives? Or would you pass it off as one of those statistics that you hear about but you never really believe? Why would you believe it? The majority of you probably only know one or two people that suffer with some form of mental health. In reality, however, this is most likely not the case. You probably know a lot more people, but they're suffering in silence. The stigma against mental illness is very, very real. The problem is that people would rather spend day after day in bed or get a panic attack every time they step into a certain room rather than to go seek help. Why? It's not that the people don't want to get help, but it's the humiliation and judgment that comes with it. So what do they do? They suppress it. They hide it. They say it's another phase or a teenage problem because ignoring it is seen as a much better solution. Still, many people see this as their only option. But it doesn't have to be this way. I'm not blindly saying, don't worry, it gets better. I honestly and truly believe that it does. Time and time again, I read articles, studies, experiences that demonstrate that finding support does benefit you. An example, the National Institute of Mental Health conducted a survey about depression in adolescents. They concluded that 80 to 90% of these adolescents were treated successfully using therapy and or medication. 80 to 90 percent. This is just one of hundreds of studies that come to the same form of conclusion. Despite this incredibly high success rate, only about a third of people with depression seek any form of help. You should not blame the person, however, for not seeking help. You've conditioned him not to take his mental health seriously. An example of this is when a person believes that their depression is just a personality flaw and not the serious medical illness that it is. We don't see mental health nearly as valid as physical health. That is no secret. In our health classes, we are taught about a range of different subjects that can be damaging to our health. I have learned about almost everything that's uncomfortable to discuss, such as smoking, drugs, alcohol, obesity, bullying, sexual education, puberty, the list goes on. While it is great that our school is providing all this information, we are leaving out a huge section of what is considered health. Health is defined as a person's physical as well as their mental condition. But in the health classes our school offers, we almost exclusively talk about the physical aspect. There is such a strong stigma that as a school, we are making the mistake of putting much more value on your physical health than on your mental well-being. Why? What are we saying as a community is most important in terms of our health? Even at our very open and liberal school, a school where students as young as the age of 10 learn about sex, where high school students are educated about what constitutes as consent, and where organizations come in to correctly talk about drugs and alcohol, we are still not able to discuss this major part of health, mental health. The stigma is so strong that despite the overwhelmingly number of people who experience this, as, long, as, as well as the severity of it, it's shocking at how little education we've actually received. Of course, People with these issues should go to the counselor. But when this is the only outlet of information that the school provides, it sends a message that this is an issue that should be behind closed doors and in private. When it's behind closed doors, you cannot see the number of people this is affecting. That is what makes it so hard to comprehend that one in four of us will develop a mental disorder. What is just as important, however, is that we educate those who do not have a mental disorder. I wanted to understand how mental illness is perceived at school, so I created the survey. The 
The last question of my survey, I asked, have you ever been diagnosed with a mental disorder? Those who said yes would have moved on to more of the questions, and those who said no would have finished the survey. I received over 120 responses, which was fantastic, because that way I could accurately compare the answers with those who did and didn't have a mental disorder. I wanted to first get the general consensus of how mental illness is perceived, so I asked, what words do you associate with mental illness? Now, when I was beginning to form my talk, I knew for certain that I wanted to talk about the stigma, as stigma is the biggest reason why people don't get help. The huge problem I had when I was going about this was deciding, should I even talk about the misconceptions? By talking about these misconceptions, would I just be fueling the stigma and validating it, or would I help people identify their wrong behavior and hopefully change it? But when I was reading some of these words that people had associated with mental illness, like crazy or psychotic, I realized that if we never talk against these words and debunk them, then change will never happen. When I asked, do you know someone close to you with a mental disorder? 75% of the students said yes. What this means is that statistically, we are very likely to have someone close to us come and tell us that they have a mental disorder. But what would happen if one of these students goes to one of their friends who thinks that now that they have a mental disorder, they are crazy or psychotic? If there are just a few things I want you to take away from today's talk, one of them is how to respond to someone who has told you about their issues. I cannot express how important it is to respond in the right way, because what you say can greatly impact what they decide to do from there. For example, if a student confides in their parents and they respond in a negative way, what do you think are the chances that that person is going to get help or even tell another person? I asked those with mental illnesses what the hardest part was about telling someone in order to understand what it was that they really needed to hear. By far, the biggest thing a person can do is to listen without judgment. The most used word I saw in all of these responses was the word judgment. People had made immediate judgments about their issues, they didn't believe it was serious, and many had said they had lost friends over it. The worst thing you can say is get over it. Again, mental and physical health, would you tell someone with a broken leg just get over it? <coughs> a thing that many people don't do, but they need to do is to get that person help. This person had possibly months or even years to go tell the counselor or go tell their parents. So that is why you can't say, go to the doctor. They've had that chance. Say, let's go to the counselors together. This can really come down to how good of a friend you are. Are you a friend who just wants to keep them on their good side? Or do you want to be that friend that might irritate them, but you eventually get them the help that they need? Another question I asked was, how much would you say you know about depression and anxiety disorders on a scale of 1 to 10? The results show that almost half the students rated themselves as a 7 or higher. While at a glance this may seem like a very good thing, there's an inherent problem with this. If you compare these answers with what people with mental disorders say, they are contradictory statements. For people with mental disorders, the people they initially told were very supportive, but when it came to telling others, as one person put it, no matter how much they care about you, they just really don't understand. So what, it, what, what this tells us is that while we think we understand a lot, in reality, we don't as much as we think. In the survey, when I asked, do you feel like school is increasing your awareness on these issues, 75% of the students said no. When looking at each individual responses, there was a pattern that kept showing up. Those who knew someone with a mental disorder were more likely to rate themselves higher on the scale of knowledge, as well as say that the school is not providing enough information. And those who didn't know anyone with a mental disorder were more likely to rate themselves lower on the scale of knowledge, as well as say that the school is providing information. Let me repeat this one more time. Those who knew someone with a mental disorder were more likely to rate themselves higher on the scale of knowledge as 
well as say that the school is not providing information. And those who didn't know anyone were more likely to say that the school wasn't, was providing information. By having mental illness or mental health in formal education, we are teaching these students about them before the issue actually arises. So they are much more better equipped to deal with their own feelings as well as someone else's. The last question of my survey was, in my opinion, the most important one. I asked those with mental illnesses, what do you want people to know about mental disorders? This was a way for me to get the opinions of those with mental illnesses at our school without them having to necessarily come forward. Every single comment, nearly every single comment, fell into one of these six categories. Number one, it's not my fault. I can't help it. Number two, don't judge me and see me as just my illness. I'm so much more. Number three, having a mental illness is just as hard or even worse than a physical injury. Number four, take it seriously and don't play it off. Number five, I'm not seeking attention. And lastly, this is much more common than you think. So in what way specifically can we increase our awareness at school? When I asked this question, the responses were endless. But generally speaking, there are three main ways. Many have said similar to what I had said, which was to teach this as a unit in health class and to the same extent as sex education or drugs. Because by having it in um, health classes, you're teaching the student that this isn't and shouldn't be a taboo topic. Another way we can increase awareness is by having assemblies or uh, advisories on this issue. So people can get the information that they need without having to come forward. And lastly, many people wanted to have awareness campaigns where experts come in and tell us their story. Because as we've learned with the survey, it's people's personal experiences with the disorder that really teaches us what it is. So learning about these issues will bring awareness and that's how we break the stigma. When mental health issues keeps us from reaching our full potential, it has to be addressed and it cannot be ignored. The reason that I'm here today is because I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated that people are suffering in silence. I'm frustrated that there's no reason to ignore it. And I'm frustrated that it doesn't have to be this way. We cannot keep going down this path. How many people have to feel like this? And I quote, the pain grew and grew and I began to experience suicidal thoughts. I realized that life for me was at a desperate impasse. I looked at rafters in the attic as places I might hang myself and I looked at sharp objects as implements I could use to cut my wrists. Does another person have to feel like this? I don't want anyone else to have to write a note like this, and I don't want anyone else to have to read a note like this. Now, this quote didn't happen at our school, but don't dismiss it. This one could have easily been one from our own school. It may very well be that the next quote will be from your best friend, your brother, your uncle, your aunt, your cousin, your neighbor. But by then, it would have been too late. What could you have done to prevent it? I'll tell you exactly where to start. Talk. Talk about it openly. That's where we begin.